Our scripture this morning is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 54. As we read of, this is the story of the centurion, but it's truly the story of the death of Jesus. And as we look forward to Easter, this is a good reminder of what Jesus went through because of his love for us. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified, and they exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. I want to look at this centurion and some of the uh, things that we find about him, and some of these have to do with just history of the Romans at that time. And I want to look at what he was like before the cross and what he was like after the cross. Before the cross, he was self-made. You know, this is a guy who had worked hard to climb the ladder, and finally he got to the top. He worked his way through his training as a soldier, and he climbed the ranks. So he was a military guy, and he was a military guy from Rome, the great city at that time. He probably prided himself in the fact that he could do whatever it takes. He had got there himself, and nobody had done it for him. Nobody had paved the way. He had done it through hard work, hard training, fighting. And he probably thought that religion was for weak people, like women and like these despised Jews that he had to deal with. So he probably didn't have much religion at all. What they did at that time is they did emperor worship, where the, the Roman emperor would come down and you were supposed to worship him as God, and they had this idea that after he died that there was some kind of continuation. And so he wasn't much for religion. He wasn't much for trusting anybody else to do anything for him. He had got there the hard way. He'd worked up, pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. So he was self-made. He wasn't given anybody else credit. The second thing we see is he was tough. He was a tough guy. I don't know if the word macho existed back in then, or it, I don't even know if it exists now. What, what's the word misogynistic or something like that? They, you know, everything changes. But anyways, whatever it was, he was one of those. He was a, he was a bad guy. He was a tough guy. He had probably had to physically conquer others to get his spot, maybe even fighting to the death. And the person who won got promoted, and the person who lost died. So he was tough. So he's looking at his work today, and he says, today's going to be an easy day. He knew he had to put to death two criminals, for sure, and... Probably a third person, but Pilate was, I'm guessing in his mind, kind of a, a weasel. 
you know, spineless guy who couldn't make up his decision which one of the other guys that he wanted to put to death because he was playing the political game and trying to be popular and all, all of those kind of things. And so when he went to bed that night before, he thought, I got two for sure tomorrow and, and a couple others, maybe four if he, if he decides to put them all to death. Because we've got this religious guy who somebody, he said something wrong and people don't like him and so they're, they're out to get him. And then we've got this guy who's killed people in the insurrection and trying to over, overthrow Rome. He said, so those guys might cause a little bit of problem. So he went to bed not knowing what he'd have to do, but he knew tomorrow would be easy for him compared to everything else that he had he had gone through. You know, he had got to the place where he didn't have to get his hands dirty anymore. He had probably done his time putting criminals on the cross. He had pounded the spikes and got to the place where that was no big deal. But now, he was to the place where all he had to do was supervise. He was just a supervisor. He had to make sure that nobody escaped that nobody came and tried to get these people off the cross. He just had to supervise the whole thing and make sure that everybody kind of stayed in line and that these criminals died the death that they deserved. So he was, he was tough. He was also hardened. He was the chief executioner. After a certain point in time of putting criminals on the cross, it just didn't even bother him anymore. It just didn't bother him. And especially the fact that these were Jews that the Romans really did not care for. And so watching the agony on the faces, hearing the desperate cries of brutal pain in this torture process, he was numb to it. Didn't bother him at all. Now, he probably didn't like it. It was a lot better. Plus, it was more prestigious to be the one in charge. So he didn't have to do the dirty work. But it wasn't like it bugged him anymore. It didn't bother him in the least. He had probably presided over the flogging of Jesus because he was in charge. And watch the soldiers spit on him, mock him, put a robe on his bloody back, and jam a crown of thorns on his head, and watched him writhe in pain. But you know what? He probably figured, so what? Let them have their fun. They might as well make the best out of this. They've got a tough job, so let them have their fun. Jesus is going to die anyways. And so in a few hours, it's not really going to matter. So whatever they're doing, it's really not important. And if it causes him extra pain, I don't really care. By the end of the day, he thought, this guy is going to be tortured to death. So what does it matter? Not only was he hardened, he was unsympathetic. These were criminals. More than that, they were Jewish. In his mind, getting rid of a few extra Jews was never a big problem. Obviously, they'd done something wrong to somebody or they wouldn't be sentenced to death. He didn't waste time caring if they had been wrongly charged. That wasn't his job. So he didn't really sit there and wonder, is this person innocent? Is this person guilty? You know, it didn't matter. They were brought to him and he had a job to do. He didn't get soft-hearted. He didn't wonder if they got a fair, fair trial. He no longer felt the pain of others. It was just another day at work. 
the, ex the ex execution would begin soon. And all he had to do was put in his time, make sure that everything went like it was supposed to, to go, and stay there until they died. This would take a while. It was a long day. And at the end of the day, if they weren't dead, they would break the legs to make sure that they would be dead so that they could leave them often till, till the next day to take them down. Then once he had certified that these criminals were dead, he could go home. His day was over. This was just pretty much a routine day for this centurion before the cross. After the cross. And he had watched Jesus. He had watched Jesus when he was tortured and all those things and seen something different. And after Jesus was put on the cross, Jesus got his attention. He had never seen anyone die like this. So he was intrigued. He was intrigued. As time went on, he saw that Jesus was not really a threat. I imagine at first he worried that the disciples were going to try to get the body of Jesus off the cross and save him, and you know, because there were a lot of people there. Jerusalem was, was really all up in arms, and there were those who were Jesus' disciples, and then there was the crowd who was against him. So he was concerned, but after a while he saw that, you know, Jesus wasn't any threat. He had told people to love their enemies, and his disciples weren't there to cause a fight. They were there to mourn. The crowds were mocking the Pharisees, the religious people, the criminals. Everybody was mocking at Jesus. And yet, Jesus had this peace on his face. And this centurion had never seen anyone at peace in the midst of suf such suffering. Then he saw him say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He had never seen forgiveness from a crucified person. At the time that they're dying and writhing in pain and in agony, Usually they are full of hatred and bitterness. And yet Jesus was full of forgiveness, and this caught his attention. So he was very intrigued. He actually started to admire the courage of someone who would face death and terror and hatred with such bravery. That probably won a few points for this centurion. He said, this guy isn't, he's not backing down, he's not changing. There's something solid about him. Jesus must have been innocent, he reasoned. But he was a little irritated at his followers. You know, if he was innocent and they knew he was innocent, shouldn't they have fought harder to take care of him and make sure this didn't happen to him? But he was beginning to be compassionate to Jesus and intrigued. The next thing we see, he was terrified. Now that probably didn't come easy for this guy. After what he had been through and what he had done, he didn't scare easily. But he saw darkness come over the land for three hours. Maybe initially he thought, uh oh, darkness could be a bad thing because somebody could rush and try to take these people down off the cross. The sun stopped shining. Then he saw the earthquake and the rocks split. And he was terrified because he knew Jesus had claimed to be the Son of God. And whether he was religious or not didn't make a difference at that point. He was spooked. He was spooked. He said, this, this hasn't happened before. This was scary. This was very scary. 
Then we see that he was convinced. It says, when he heard his cry and saw how he died. You know, this morning I've given you just little pieces of how I imagine that probably happened and what he was seeing. Boy, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to know all the details of exactly what it was about Jesus' death that convinced this guy? When he, saw, when he heard his cry, the way Jesus cried out, must have been different than every other person who died on a cross. And when he saw how he died, he was convinced. He was convinced that something was different about this man. He was convinced that surely this is a righteous man, he says. And then finally, he is convinced that he is the Son of God. It even says he praised God. And we don't know exactly what for, but he praised God in that moment. He glorified God, which just means he, he acknowledged God. He realized, and he was convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. And then later we see he also was convinced that Jesus was dead. He certified that to Pilate. He was the one that Joseph came to. When, Pilate, when Joseph went to Pilate, Pilate sent for this centurion to say, hey, is, is he dead already? And this centurion certified, and he said, yes, he is. So he was convinced that he was dead, and he was convinced that he is the Son of God. The last thing I want to look at, was he converted? Was he converted? And we have a question mark because the Bible doesn't tell us. History doesn't tell us what happened to this guy after that day. He may have gone on and been a follower of Jesus, or he may have said, wow, this was the Son of God and this happened. That was a mistake. And he might have gone on and gone back to his life of doing what he knew how to do and doing what he did best just with the knowledge that wow that that was important he really was the son of God and yet not of actually been converted or had his life changed or accepted Jesus forgiveness and the death that Jesus made on the cross and you know I think this is so important for each of us. God's asking, not asking us this morning, are you convinced? I believe the fact that you're in this building today shows that you're convinced. You're convinced that Jesus is the Son of God or why waste our time? And I want to talk just real, real personally to you this morning. We can be convinced that Jesus is the Son of God. And I don't, know, I don't know your stories. I know most of you and have been enjoying getting to know you. And you're just, you're just all great people and I love you all. I really do. And I don't know a lot about the history of your church and how everybody believes and everything like that. But you know, you can believe the right stuff and believe Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says even the demons believe Jesus is the Son of God. And we know they're not going to be in heaven, right? And this morning I want to challenge you and I want to encourage you. Obviously you've been faithful to come to church. Maybe your whole life you've come to church. You pray, you do all the right things, you love God. Has there been a time in your life when you've said, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I want to be a new creature in you. It's basically a simple prayer. It's a simple prayer. And one of the reasons that I bring this up is because I was raised in a church 
And thankfully, this, this church is not the way it was when I was there today. It's, it's doing very well. It's a small Methodist church, and God's doing wonderful things in it. But when I was growing up, I asked a couple questions. I asked if you had to be good to go to heaven. What do you think my Sunday school teacher told me? Yes. My question was, how good? How good? What could I get away with? Is that a fair question? Well, try to do more good than bad. I was a little kid. How do you weigh those things? I'm an adult. I still don't know how to weigh those things. What if you do one really bad thing? How many really good things do you have to do to make up for that, right? I didn't know how to weigh that. Then I asked another question, because that was back in the day. When, when you went to church, you had to wear these polyester suits. I was a little kid, and I didn't like itchy clothes. <laughs> and I, so I said, do you have to go to church to go to heaven? And they said, well, you just you try to. And then I remember, they said, it's kind of like, like a filling station. You go up, and you fill up when you're empty. I thought, shoot, I don't feel empty, <laughs> so I must not have to go very much. And it was really more that do more good things than bad, try to come to church. And when I did come to church, you know what? I got looked down on, or at least I felt that I was. I don't know, maybe, maybe I wasn't. Maybe they were glad that I was there, but it was like, oh, wow, where have you been? The kind of guilt trip, whether they meant it to be a guilt trip or meant it to be we're glad you're here, it was like guilt trip. So I didn't want to go there because everybody would say, where have you been? And I'd been home helping Dad. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what it really meant to be a Christian. I was convinced. I never remember a time in my life where I didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. And I prayed, especially if I had a test to take and hadn't studied. Or if I was in trouble with Mom or Dad. Really prayed about those times. <laughs> save my skin kind of prayer. But you know what? I didn't know Jesus. I believed in him, but I didn't know him. And, you know, that can be the problem. Nobody makes it clear. Nobody had made it clear to me until I was about 16, 17. And this centurion, he believed he was the son of God. But he may not have t taken that next step to say, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. And I want you to kind of take over my life. And I want to follow you from now on. And that's really it. It's a simple prayer that you pray in the quietness of your own heart. But as your pastor, I really feel an obligation to make sure that you have that message. That you have taken that step. And maybe you take, take, took that step as a very little child. Maybe you've taken it just a couple weeks or months ago. You know, that doesn't matter. But it does matter that we've received Jesus personally. He's not just the Savior of the world, but he's the Savior of each of us individually. But we have to take that step and ask. And by saying this, please don't think that I'm up here thinking that, well... You know, this person or that person isn't a Christian. I don't know. That's between you and God. But my responsibility is to make sure that you hear clearly, as clearly as I can make it. And give you the opportunity to pray. And so I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to, for all of us to just bow our heads right now. And... If you've never, if you're not sure, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, you're not sure you're a Christian, you, you don't remember that time when you gave your heart completely to Jesus. Pray this prayer quietly within your heart. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. From this day forward, 
Take my life, Lord. Use it for your glory. Let me follow you. Forgive my sins. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time, tell somebody. Tell somebody so they can pray for you. Tell somebody who you know would really like to know that. And that'll, that'll close our service. We'll have our uh, video here in a minute and continue to pray for that.